Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Lamont, and welcome to NYO Canada Online Workshops. Our YouTube live chat is open, and we will be fielding questions, though mostly um, we'll answer all questions at the end of the presentation. Though please feel free to uh, feel free to comment, post questions, and of course chat amongst each other. Um, today's presenter is a consultant to Olympic and Paralympic athletes and coaches, as well as a recent inductee into the Concordia University Sports Hall of Fame. Please welcome Dr. Summer Christie. Thank you so much. Uh, I really want to thank you, uh, NYO, and everybody for the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I am going to talk about the Olympic audition, so uh, and spe specifically on performance on demand focus. Um, I, yes, my background is in sport, but um, as you'll see here, um, I did start in music uh, thanks to my aunt who I looked up to when I was a kid. I played oboe for a good portion of my life and uh, thought that would be it, but turned in turned to rugby after that and ended up playing for Team Canada for several years and then reflected on what would it uh, be to go back into sports psychology. So today we're going to really just talk about sport slash performance psychology. So I'm really going to put them together because as much as I work with Olympic athletes, Paralympic athletes, musicians and dancers, performers in any way are, can benefit from the exact same skills that we use termed sports psychology. So I will, I'll, I'll reframe it. We use sports psychology a lot, but I'll say it's very much um, performance psychology. I'm going to briefly touch on that then touch on mental toughness. I'm sure you've heard that term before, whether you're thinking about a like an NFL player or whether you're thinking about that tough audition, um, very similar. I'd like to debunk any myths we might have about what mental toughness is. And then really hone in on focus. So I will have another session on arousal regulation, so that anxiety management. But today we're gonna really focus on focus. <laughs> so, Sport performance psychology, um, what is it? And I'd like to start with a series of questions that to sort of ask yourself along the way. And before I get started with those questions, um, if you do have a deck of cards with you, I'd like you to keep them handy because we're going to have a little bit of a challenge, a fun game, but also a challenge that we'll talk about with focus. So if you can, grab them, get them with you, and count out eight of them. Um, but that's not going to happen yet. So when we talk about sport performance psychology or performance psychology, I just want you to ask yourself these questions. And, and you may or may not have already taken courses or heard from people that do performance psychology. I know there's a lot of terrific sessions within this program. So maybe you've already asked yourself these questions before, but I'd like to just sort of frame it and ask you these questions at the start. So, Am I committed to being the best possible musician that I can be? Am I mentally ready to perform under pressure and on demand? So important distinction there. Do I think and act positively? And what does positively mean? Do I believe in myself and my ability to perform? Do I have the confidence to go out there and perform? Am I aware of the distractions that I might face and how best to deal with them? Do I know what focus allows me to perform my best? Do I have a plan to manage anxiety in those big moments? Do I self-evaluate and try and improve every day? And I know you do as far as your practice, but is there's a little bit more, and that's what I'd like to challenge is the mental side to performance is we can actually work on that. And speaking of which, now is the perfect time to start thinking about mental performance and how you can incorporate it into your practice, into your performance, because we've got some time off. Well, we're not meeting face to face. So we've got some time for reflection and we've got some time to sort of work on this and see where we can improve. 
Um, right now, I'll start with a little bit of my philosophy on performance psychology. So right now, what you see, we have a lot of pieces to the puzzle. So for performance, you've done tons of tra uh, practice. You've done tons of hours with your, your teachers. You've learned, you've listened, you've done so much. There's technical sides. There's like everything that sort of fits into that puzzle that enables you to perform. So what you see here looks like a high jump. So if you've seen sports, uh, the high jump is something you can, uh, you run up, you run up on your, your feet, like no pole or nothing. You run up and then you jump over backwards. So it's, it's high. So I usually ask athletes and I'll consider yourself an athlete in this moment or whatever. Um, that bar um, is your ability. So how high you can jump is your ability. So that's what you know you're able to do. So that comes for athletes from training, practice, proper nutrition, sleep, um doing the right things and just that builds over time so you can think of what creates your ability as a musician so maybe it's the hours you put in training maybe it's the extra training you do the extra listening to music you do the extra work the reading anything that you do that creates that ability so that builds up over time okay and becomes something stable so it's like how high you can jump but we all know um I'll put it out there, we do all know that we have, we can have a peak performance. We can have that spectacular, beautiful performance that you just hadn't had yet, just a little bit better than you, what you know you can do, where you're really in the flow. Maybe you're, you're not thinking, you're feeling, you're just in that moment entirely and just performing to the best of your ability. So we have that, but we also know there's an opportunity to have a weak performance. So not even higher, but quite a bit lower. And so if everything that's concrete, like practice, hours you put in, that doesn't change, right? Your ability stays the same. But the difference between this peak performance and weak performance, I'd like you to consider what that is. Because I'm going to say it's mental, but not in a bad way. Okay, so the difference truly is, what I'm going to say is the last piece of the puzzle, which is going to be your opportunity. And that's if we can train our focus, if we can train our ability to manage our nerves, if we can tr like work on goal setting, actually really do a lot of things to train our mind, we can use this as an opportunity to really always attain that ability and peak performance. So let's fit in that last piece of the puzzle. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is mental toughness. So it is talked about a lot in sport, and I imagine it's talked a lot of music as well. And it's often, I would say, sometimes a term that's hard or people say make judgments on mental toughness. And I'd like you to think for a moment what you think a mentally tough musician might look like. So really think, you can think of somebody you looked up to, maybe a mentor, maybe a teacher, uh, a performer that you really, truly look up to. What do they do that's different? How do they act? How do they prepare? What do they, how do they think? How do they talk? I'm going to assume probably a lot of you are saying confidence, focus, things like that. So with that the definition for mental toughness is not something you have or you don't it's not something you're born with it's not some innate ability that's magical or any other reason like that it's truly and this definition actually comes from athletes but i'd say and you can tell me it, it very much aside from the well the competitor or the opponent is the same too um but it very much fits well in our world as well so mental toughness is defined as having the natural or developed psychological edge that enables you to cope better and specifically be more consistent and better than your opponents, okay? In an audition, you do have opponents, in remaining determined, focused, confident, and in control under pressure. So nowhere here does it say you win all the time or it's something you're born with. And it's not only one thing. It's not something you have or you don't. It's a combination of a bunch of things. The ability to cope, consistency, focus, in control under pressure, uh, confidence, right? A whole bunch of different things that kind of build a mentally tough musician.
So um, as I mentioned, today we're going to talk about focus and then the next the next session, which will actually be Thursday on at 11, so hopefully you'll be there. Um, we're gonna talk more about that ability to remain controlled under pressure. So more our physiological responses to stress and how we manage that. So for now, let's dig in quite a bit deeper on focus, okay? So we've turned that, thrown that around. I think for a moment what that means to you, what it feels like to be focused, maybe what it feels like to be unfocused, often by thinking about what the opposite is, it helps us understand it. And now we're gonna start with the challenge, okay? So the first challenge I have for you, so if you do have those eight cards, okay? The challenge that I have for you is I would like you to build a card house out of eight cards. Um, so it cannot be flat on the table. You can't use anything to prop it up. Okay. No bending of the cards. Trust me when I do this, I get a lot of cheaters. So, um, it has to be all eight cards standing up in some sort of a card house. Okay. So I'm going to, so for now cards are down and hands are up in the air. So no early starting. I know it's, it's honor code here because I'm not actually able to see you and you can't see your, your colleagues or anything. Um, but hopefully you have the cards there and you're ready to go. So it's going to be cards down, hands up. Um, and when I say go, um, you're going to go. And then um, we'll see how fast you can do it. So I want you to time yourself. And maybe in the chat box later, you can tell me what time you got. Okay. So cards down, hands up. Ready, set, go. <laughs> actually seeing faces and being able to know how you did or what it looked like or poke fun a little bit and walk around and, and throw in some distractions. But for a moment, um, think about how well you did there. So I, I won't know how many you got or how long it took. If you got them, if you got a card house done, congratulations. Well, well done. How did you do that? What did you do? And if you really had a hard time getting them done or getting there, what were the what were the distractions what was it about that scenario that was distracting and even looking at this slide i'm sure some of you are crawling in your skin because it's a huge distractions with spelling mistakes don't worry they're on purpose um right up here on the slide so what are distractions distractions can be uncontrollable controllable they can be external, so something outside in the world, like the video or the monkeys perhaps dancing. They can also be internal, like if you had somebody next to you, oh, their card house is, they're doing that pretty quick. I'm not doing that as quick, right? That's internal. They can be real distractions, like the lights going out, right? Or, or real loud sounds that actually interfere with what you're doing, or they can be imagined, and that's really the, where the thoughts come in. Really, distractions are anything that is not on task. So in order to, um, in order to sort of explain focus a little bit better, um, it's helpful to understand distractions. So first off, I'd like you to think of your best ever performance. So think of that one time where things flowed, it was beautiful, there was no doubts, no thoughts, you just almost lost yourself in your performance and in your music. What did you pay attention to? So 
focus, I mean, um, can seem like a very fluffy term, but if you make, if you put it into real simple terms, it's what you're paying attention to. So if you're truly focused in those best ever performances, you're, you're likely not paying attention to, to very much. You're likely paying attention to yourself and your music, right? So if you're to imagine your focus and your best focus being the center of that dartboard, that's me and my music, okay? So think about really what that feels like, what that looks like for you. But that good focus target on the dartboard is me and my music. So now we'll talk about the distractions. And this is a really good tool if you wanna just draw out a dartboard and keep drawing these, these terms and brainstorming ideas within these circles, please feel free to do so. So in that min middle circle, that's me and my music. And maybe there's a couple other things that lead up to your best performance, but really me and my music. The first level of distractions outside of that perfect best focus are things in the environment. So think to yourself now, what in your environment might cause a distraction? So things in the environment are things that are there that are present, but you have no control over. So that might be who is in the environment. Maybe it's the judges, the conductor, maybe your teacher. Maybe it's your parents in the audience, right? Maybe it's good friends. Maybe it's your competition that are there backstage with you. That is away from that best good feeling of focus, right? We're thinking about them. So what or who could be in your environment that you really have no control over? They're present. They're always going to be there. What could be that distraction? So if you're drawing out this circle, in that circle, right, parents, competitors, other, you know, other musicians, whatever that might be for you. I'll tell you why we're writing it out when we get there. The next level of distractions above that is comparisons. So there may be a fellow musician that is competing for the same position in backstage with you. So not only are they just in the environment and you see them in their distraction, but we're now comparing ourselves. Oh, she's so good. Oh, I don't know if I'll be as good as, as him over there. Or even the comparison can also be, oh, this is going to be easy. Those guys are no good. That's not real focus. That's not true in the moment focus. That's a little bit outside of that, making those comparisons. And for all of you who are out there, and I imagine pretty much this whole group probably is, a little perfectionist in a way, is you're often comparing yourself to yourself. So if we've had a good performance, we want to match or make it better. And if, for example, we made a mistake, we just really don't want to make that happen again. Right, So we're constantly judging ourselves and, and expecting more and more out of ourselves as well. So consider that in that circle as you're writing those things down. Think about who, what might I be comparing myself to? Then outside of that, sorry, are the outcomes. So this is like in that Olympic audition <laughs> is what's going to happen? And am I going to get the seat? Am I going to get the job or not? Right. So if I'm playing my music and worrying about if they're going to like me, what the judges are going to think, if I'm going to get this job, then I'm not in the moment. Then I'm not just me and my music. I'm way outside of that. Right. Um, so it's all of those outcomes that might be outside of it. So consider what that might be for you. And, I, and, and in this category, I also throw in making a mistake. So if we make a mistake, that likely means we're worried about the outcome, right? So we want to, if we're worried about making a mistake, it can be it fit in that circle too. Then on top of that, um, we're getting a little bit further, and there's one even further out after that, are the consequences of those outcomes. So what does it mean if I don't get the seat, the position? What will people think? Will I let anybody down? Will I let myself down? The consequences might be, I'm gonna feel really depressed. I'm gonna feel disappointed in myself. 
You know, there's a lot of consequences and maybe it's financial. Maybe it's, I won't be able to pay my rent next week if I don't get this job, right? Again, this is further and further away from where you need to be when you're at your best. And we, we know that in an audition, that's the moment we absolutely need to be at our best, but that's also the moment where the distractions are the highest, right? The, the last one outside of that are questions of meaning. So this one is a little bit tricky and hopefully um, you may or may not have been there. When it comes to focus, questions of meaning can mean I'm so confused and unfocused, I don't know what's going on. But I'd say in high performance sport, high performance musicians, just as yourself, it's rarely that. It's uh, more, why, why am I doing this? Why am I here? So sometimes we get to a place that's so far away from that good feeling, that joyful feeling of performance and music that we're just not enjoying it. It's hard. It's stressful. I consider whether I want to continue. Like it just becomes less enjoyable. And if you've ever been there or in this is where you're going to push on burnout, for example, I ask you if that's very fun. And I'm going to assume the answer is no. Um, it's hard to be there and consider then now going back to step one, how fun is it when you are in that moment, when it's just you and your music and you're performing at your best and you're loving every second. And the reason I highlight that difference is because sometimes people just say, Hey, go have fun out there. And it might be feel a little bit annoying. I know I used to say that I'm like, it's not fun. I'm working hard, right? Like I'm trying to do something here or okay, fine, whatever, you're just making it fluffy. But the reality is, is you perform best when you're enjoying it. So there is truth behind actually go out there, have fun, enjoy it, love what you do. And again, so the reason I point out all these distractions, what's important is if you just say, don't think about it, it doesn't necessarily disappear. So what we want to do is we want to sort of become aware of them and acknowledge them they you know what this is an important audition if i don't get this i'm going to struggle with rent next month okay so that's something you can't just forget or you know like frozen let it go i i mean i love that but at the same time sometimes those are real issues that are hard okay so with this it's how do we acknowledge what they are and then find a way to just put them to the side so that I can come back to what's really important to my performance, which is me and my music. So you're acknowledging and then coming back with a cue or something that brings you back into that moment, into those that simplified thinking, not simplified thinking, but you know, focus. So throwing this out there, if you're performing, behind a curtain it doesn't matter <laughs> you're performing behind a curtain in front of the judges if this is what's going on in your head do you see how cloudy your focus can get right we can only pay attention to so many things at the same time and if this is all going on that's going to make it harder to think about what you really do need to think about which is me and my music Right. And of course, if you're performing in an ensemble, it's very different. OK, it's you, your team, right? And your group. But consider that, that it's worthwhile to challenge those thoughts or at least to acknowledge them and find a way to let them go so that you can come back to that joyful place where you can perform at your best. I'm going to show you two quick videos. Um, and this is of Chantelle Petit Claire. She's she's from the Beijing Olympics. She won several gold medals um, in sprint wheelchair racing. So I just want you to look at this and think of how she is focusing prior to her race. I do apologize, it's very pixelated, it's not a great video, but it's the best I possibly have. Um, and you'll know who I'm talking about when we get there. So they're in Beijing.
So that's her focus, free race. And yeah, she it might look a little scary. She's got her game face on, right? But it doesn't matter how you look. Think about what she's doing or what she's not doing in that situation. So compared to the other athletes that are around her either side, the camera is right in their face. There's music going on. They're waving at the crowd. They're looking around. And Chantal is already in her race. She's focused. So you don't have to have that sort of mean or, or, or like that, that face, for example. But her mind and her brain is in the lane ahead of her and not worried about the camera in front of her, not worried about the fans, not worried, about, not even looking at her opponents next to her. Because what's, what's important is in the lane ahead of her. So I will show you her, her race. So this might be more difficult to see. She is one, two, three, four, five down from the top in red with a dark ponytail. She's behind right now, about in third. Okay, you help with that finish All right, so now consider her race. And so I, she won multiple gold medals, but this gold medal meant a lot. It's, it's not her discipline, it was a new race. And I think you could see, even, even though it's not the best quality video, that she did not start at the, at the front. She was not the leader, right? And you can think of when you're in a, in a running race or you're directly comparing yourself to somebody who's next to you, it's really easy to go, how. How well are they doing? What are they thinking? Like, oh, they're ahead of me. Oh, they're behind me, right? We might gain confidence if they're they're behind us and think we're in the lead and then slow down. Or we might stress out because they're ahead of us, right? But if you look at her, she was behind. She did not look anywhere around. She had her head down and all she did was push as hard as she possibly could. So that's that's me. That's me and my music. That's me and my lane. Right, that best focus. Sorry. So since we've talked about best focus, let's. I just want to throw out some myths there, because um, about suboptimal performance, because we've likely all heard the term um, like mentally weak or somebody choking, right, freezing. Um, I just want to talk about those myths because it's important. It links well to focus itself. So myths about choking. Myths are that you're not trying. And this comes, you know, I, 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 you probably hear it if you get feedback. Somebody making an assumption of what happened for you, right? If you didn't perform as well as you could or have done before, um, people might think you're not trying, okay? Or can't do it. You can tell me if you've heard these things before, right? They, they don't care anymore. Or maybe they've lost it, lost control. They're just not good under pressure or they're not mentally tough. So those are all myths, okay? Um, because sub suboptimal performance is not because you didn't care, because you didn't try, because you can't do it. The real definition for suboptimal, for choking is, choking is suboptimal performance. So that means it's a performance that's inferior to what you can do and have done in the past, and it occurs Keep this in mind, when you feel the pressure to get everything right. So it's when we care too much. So a lot of the times people think choking is because you gave up or you didn't try. But more often than not, with any athlete, with any musician, with any performer that I work with, it's because they care too much. Okay? And I'll show you one theory that really, truly resonates um, with me because I study the brain. That is my other side of the work that I do is I research the brainwave activity while we're performing. But it's a cognitive theory, okay? Um, basically what happens when we learn a skill, so you think about learning your fingering, for example. When you first learned, or your first lessons, think about how awkward and chunky that was. It's like, oh, my finger's gotta go there, and I'm like, well, you know, it's very awkward and chunky. So that's when you're in the cognitive phase, phase you're really thinking about the pieces, you're trying to put them together, and it's slow and chunky. But as you progress and you get a little bit better, you integrate. 
And then all of a sudden you're teaching yourself, right? And you're getting better and those skills are getting better, smoother, okay? And then we move to the third stage, which is an automatic stage. So that's when the skills, you don't even have to think about them anymore. Like your fingering, you don't have to think about where to put your finger. When you first picked up your instrument, you're probably like this, 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 right? And now it's like, it just happens, okay? So that's the progress of how we learn skills. And in the brain, it's a pattern. And when you repeat that pattern, that's why practice makes, not perfect, but practice makes you really good, <laughs> uh, makes it automatic, let's say. That pattern gets reinforced in your brain so that it's a stage that's really, um, that it flows and it's automatic. So you can free up your attention to think about other things, maybe like sound or the, like, um, playing with an ensemble and not just like, how do I put my fingers? Right. So the, the choke theory behind that. So that's the stages of cognitive stages of learning. The choke is that sometimes what happens when it's really important is we care. And you know what I say, I really care and I don't want to make a mistake. So I'm going to try really hard to do this well. So all of a sudden, I'm thinking about those things back from stage one even that I never thought of before. So I'm like, this better be right. I've got to put my fingers to ear. The sound's got to be here. So I'm thinking about so many more things than I, than I do normally think about when I'm performing at my best. Okay? So you're controlling too much. You're excessively monitoring and controlling and paying attention to the things that you, that you don't necessarily when, you're, when it's at your best. There is um, a theory, uh, well, the, the, well, the New Zealand All Blacks use redhead, bluehead. Um, and this is my research, but I'll say redhead, bluehead. Redhead um, means that it's a cue word or a trigger that would say, I'm, I'm distracted, I'm worried, I'm not thinking about the right things. Whereas a bluehead means my mind is clear. I am, I'm ready to play. I'm in, I'm in a good space. Uh, interestingly enough, they just use those as keywords, but in my research, I've been able to find that, and this is with ice hockey players, but when we're not in a focus state, so when they missed the net, they had a red head. And when they made the shot, they had a blue head. And so I won't get into details, but blue means more of a specific bandwidth, which is linked to focus. So how? So now I'm going to throw out um, a few steps to how. So we've talked about it, and I say the best place to start is by reflecting on your own focus and to start thinking about it. So number one on how to focus is know what to pay attention to and when. So know what to pay attention to and when. So if you think back to that, the dartboard, that middle circle, that's what you want to understand. Okay. You understand what, what that is and, you know, and, and really understand it better. So a good way to start to understand that is from a tool from Terry Orlick. And it's a great book called in pursuit of excellence. If you're interested in a sports psychology book that will be applicable, if you just replace athlete with musician, you'll, you'll do really well with that book with a lot of exercises. But, um, is to explore your best and less than best performances. So less than best is a nice way of saying worst, right? So when I've done great and when I've done really bad. So questions you can ask yourself. Um, in my best ever performance, how would I describe my focus, thoughts, or feelings? What was I focused on during my performance? So what was I paying attention to? Was I paying attention to more the feel of the music or was I we'll get into the negative ones or what, what was it that I was actually paying attention to in my best performance? Did I ever lose that focus? We can all lose focus, right? But in a best performance, you likely came back. So if you did lose focus, what did you do to get back on track? If you never lost focus, what kept you connected, right? Like sit with these thoughts and really put yourself in that performance and try and remember back to it and what that felt like. So now, and here's the hard part, but I promise it'll be worth it in the end, is now think of your worst performance. How would I describe my thoughts and my feelings? What was I paying attention to? Was I paying attention to somebody in the crowd? Was I worried about the outcome of the event? What was I thinking? And if I did 
um, if, if I ever did fully, uh, even feel fully focused, high quality connection, if yes, what did I do to get there? So if you were able to turn it around, what did you do? Or if you never, ever felt really focused, what kept you disconnected? What thought was it? What thing in the environment? What distraction was it? And then with that, you can describe your best focus because I guarantee you're going to see the difference between my best and my less than best are often like the exact opposite, right? I wasn't thinking about this. I was thinking about this, right? So you can describe what that is. So if you start to understand it, then you can create a focus plan. And a focus plan is very simple. It's what should I do? Why should I do it? And what should I do if it doesn't work? Okay. So this is really important for important events. So for your Olympic audition, this is definitely something you should do is plan it out. Okay. You know what your best focus is. You know what your distractions are. So what should I do? So think of the whole day, even the night before and list everything mental, physical that you need to do in order to perform at your best. So yeah, even what do I eat for breakfast? How do I warm up? Right? How do I fall asleep at night? What should I be paying attention to, right? Then list the reasons why you should do it. So maybe it involves using some affirmations saying, I can do this. I'll be great. I know I can. And then taking a few breaths. And why it's important is because if I let myself get caught up, then I might forget this and I might not be able to perform at my best. And then importantly, too, is what should I do if it doesn't work? So if I can't eat my optimal breakfast or do my perfect state well, showing up late, well, that is can be a stressful event, right? If you show up late and you don't have the, uh, the, the optimal time to warm up and to get ready, we can that can turn into like way outside in the circle. Like, oh, I'm never going to get the job because I'm not ready. Or we can say, you know what? I just need to take a deep breath. I've got this much time. What can I do? within this time and the more you prepare for it the less it'll catch you off guard so another thing i'd like to bring up which is important is how we focus and again how i said it's important to be positive um, because being happy and enjoying the moment is actually important it's really important to have a positive focus and when i say positive focus i don't mean I'm not being fluffy. I'm not saying, oh, rainbows and butterflies, it'll just be fine. I mean, real positive focus. So, and I did mention that before, the brain doesn't understand the word don't. So if you put it in front of anything, it doesn't matter. So if I'm saying, for example, and this is actually ultimately positive. So if you want to practice and go hard and you just keep saying don't quit don't quit don't quit don't quit don't quit don't quit what are you still saying to yourself you're saying quit your mind is still on quitting right so instead of saying that shift it to something that's positive so that's something that's real that you can do that you can action so what am i going to do okay so again focus on what you want to do not on what you don't want to do and this sits really well when we're worried about mistakes. So maybe that hard, hard part in the piece that you want to perform and you're like, I hope I better not make a mistake here. I better not make a mistake here. Don't make a mistake here. You're thinking about making this, the mistake. So instead shift it to what do I want to pay attention to? Okay. Maybe it's how you cue in or, or how you set up or hearing or feeling the music or something like that. That's up to you, but don't use the word don't. Um, then another one, when it comes to outcomes, we, we, we want to win, but that's challenging. And when you're focusing just on the win, that is that outside circle, that outcome circle. So a good acronym to remember in any situation really what, where you want to win is to separate that and to really consider instead what's important now. So the win is all about the outcome. You won't get the win if you can't focus on what you need to do in that moment, okay? Um, so take the time and be, I love this quote, it's be where your feet are, right? Be present, be in that moment, let go of everything else. 
be in that in that moment what's important now not what's going to happen after they make a judgment or not what's going to happen when i talk to my parents on the way home it's what's important now is me in the center of that um, flowing and performing the best so number two for focus is have a distraction control plan okay so if you draw that dartboard take all the things that are in that dartboard throw it into this grid and make a plan for them okay so i said we're not ignoring them we're acknowledging them and then we're creating a plan so list the distractions internal external that might come to you it's good to think about your typical response so for example if the distraction is i'm so worried about making a mistake what usually happens to your performance i know for me, it would have been if I really worry about making a mistake, I'm thinking about it, I'm worrying about it, then I'm, you know, my performance is going to be as good. Either I'm tense, I'm worried, I'm, I'm uh, hesitating, or I even make the mistake altogether, right? So usually it doesn't help your performance. How would you prefer to respond when you have that distraction? Uh, I'd rather say to myself, no problem, mistakes happen, and nobody's perfect, and continue to perform. Because I'd rather be make one mistake, which takes two seconds, rather than be tense for the entire audition. Then think of, you know, a, a cue word or a refocus reminder, something that'll help bring you back on task. So something to just say, I've acknowledged this. How do I come back to here? So then have a refocus strategy. Okay. So this is when we've gone to the end. We've acknowledged them. It's like, how do I come back? So there's some simple ways to do it. Everybody's gonna find their um, unique way. One would be to use a keyword. So you can say focus, snap, you've got this, okay, right? Um, I know for a fact when I was an athlete, I said focus, but I also in my head was saying focus, what the heck is wrong with you when I made a mistake? So be clear and be careful with how you do use those keywords. Use an action. So a really good one's tree it. And that comes, uh, I've heard that from Terry or like as well. It's the idea is that you touch something and you let go of those worries. I'm basically letting my worries go into this tree. And then when I let go, I'm going to come back into this comfortable zone. Okay. Maybe you want to snap, maybe you have an elastic band on your wrist and you snap it probably, probably doesn't optically look great. And I, and I kind of added this one in too. It was like, maybe you spit, Maybe part of like what you do to let go an action is you just empty your spit valve. Maybe you just you just let it all go. I'm so worried or I, I made a mistake. You just empty it, let it fall in the floor and let it go away from you. And then there's also self-talk. So I'm going to go a little bit more specific in the next slide. So we have an ongoing conversation in our head all day, all the time. And I it can be negative, it can be neutral, and it can be positive, right? But when we're worried, when we're under pressure, we can go to the negative. So here's a simple acronym to help you with this. And what I do is start reflecting on what you do actually say to yourself so you can start changing it. So think of a traffic light and the word stop, okay? So when that negative thought pops up in your head, just say stop. That's your redhead, like the New Zealand All Blacks, like that uh, brainwave image. Stop it. I just want you to say it out loud, say it in your head, and physically just stop the thought from continuing. You can, you can even tell your, your, um, your colleague next to you, you can say stop. If you notice them ruminating or worrying, you say, hey, not out of it, you know, stop. Then yellow light. So this is where we're waiting, we're idling, right? So think, okay? Rationalize, look for evidence. So I'm so worried I'm gonna make a mistake. Where's the evidence that you're gonna make a mistake? Is that fair? Is that real? So what, and the best thing to ask yourself in this moment would be, what would my best friend tell me? They'd probably say, or what would I tell my best friend? I'm so worried I'm gonna make a mistake. You'd probably say, everybody makes mistakes, you'll be fine. And I bet you believe it when you tell somebody else, it's just a little bit harder to say it to yourself. So think, and then O is for organize. How would you prefer to respond? This goes with that distraction control plan. How would you prefer to respond? I'd rather tell myself, it's okay, I'm nervous. You know what, come back to my task. I can do this. And then 
green light, or I put it as a blue light, proceed, blue light, short sentence, keyword, action, or something that helps you refocus on the task at hand. So number four, and then there's only one after that, um, is practice your focus, okay? It didn't take you one um, webinar for an hour to learn how to play your instrument, I'm assuming. So it's not gonna take one webinar listening to me to learn how to focus, okay? This is something you have to work on yourself and it'll take journaling, debriefing, or we're gonna talk about that next, and, and even just practicing, and you probably do a lot of these tools to learn your, your trade, your skill. Um, one example here, and you can be creative with this, but I say try and read on a busy bus. That gives you the opportunity to try and tune out and tune in the things you want to, right? So just practice it. Find a way to zone in, zone out, limit distractions. And practice under pressure. And this is called simulation training. So making it harder maybe than it would even ever be in a competition or in an audition, for example. Here's a, just an example, a silly example of football. But what they're doing is trying to catch a ball while they're throwing their arms up in front and even whacking the guy while he's trying to catch it. Okay. So that's, well, that's closer. That's simulating real pressure. Okay. So find a way to simulate pressure because if you're always practicing alone in a room that's quiet and comfortable and there's nothing, then that's what you're going to be prepared for. You're not going to necessarily be prepared for the judges, the people backstage, um, all of the things that you know could go wrong. Maybe throw in to yourself just to say, okay, I'm going to do a, a mock audition and show up late on purpose, right? And how are you going to deal with that, right? Practice that distraction control plan. Then finally, debrief your focus. So I'm going to say debrief is the biggest, one of the biggest skills for performance psychology because it's the most important for you to actually continue to improve. So often we talk about it, we acknowledge it, but we don't really change it or we don't really actually pat on ourselves, uh, pat ourselves on the back and learn from what we did well, right? So say we had a terrific performance, okay? We might say, oh, that was so great. I'm so happy. Let's go celebrate. Did you learn anything? Maybe. Maybe not, right? You're, you're letting that. There's so many valuable things you can learn from debriefing a great performance. So think, what went well and why? What was my focus like? What was I paying attention to? How did I do this? And then, you know, when it's bad, sometimes we say, oh, that was terrible. It was so not me. I, like, I don't even want to think about it. But those are the opportunities where we can really learn to be better. What can, so it's what can we do to improve, right? Um, so to challenge yourself to go deep, and it's hard to look at those ones that aren't great. It's easier to forget them. But go in there, journal about it, figure it out, pinpoint it. I guarantee you're going to find out it's probably a very small thing in a very big performance. But then, importantly, is, well, what am I going to do with that information? What am I going to do? How am I going to be better? So if you have your focus plan, distraction control plan, you do an audition. And then after the audition, you debrief it. You say, well, this went well. This could have been better. This is what I'm going to do next time. So you say, okay, well, I'm not going to do this because that didn't work. Or I'm going to show up earlier because I was not well prepared. Um, and just think about what you can do to improve. My rules, <laughs> my rules are important uh, for um, high performance people um, because I, like I said, I know you're all hard on yourselves probably and you work really hard and you have high expectations of yourself. So I'd like you to keep it simple and performance based. So performance based means you can't debrief your, you can only debrief your performance versus your own performance. You don't want to compare yourself to other people because that's unjust. Maybe that person had a great day. Maybe they had a not so great day, right? So simple and based on your own performance, be objective. Don't judge. So the minute we have something bad or we make a mistake, that self-talk can go even into a loop that says, you're so stupid. I can't believe you just did that. That's, that's judgment, that's subjective, that's unfair and unrealistic, right? So maybe try and be more objective. 
I made a mistake. Let's break it down. Why did it happen? How could it be better? Right? So be a little more fair. And then the last, sorry, the last one is more positives than negatives. So make sure, especially when you're highly critical and push yourself a little bit harder, look for the positives, seek them out. Okay. Cause I guarantee you in however long that piece is that you're performing for your audition, if you make a mistake, it's probably only a fraction of a second. So consider the whole thing. And uh, I forgot, but I, I have GSP up there. If anybody is from Quebec, they would know that he is a very um, a highly decorated MMA player. And I have his picture there from with debriefing because he, after every fight, so he could have just won the world, the belt, right? The championship belt or every fight, win loss. He goes straight back into the locker room, onto the mat with his coach and goes through every single move he did. Every single move, he says, this went well. This is what worked against him. This is what I'm going to do better next time. Or, oh, you know what? This really didn't work against this guy. You know, I need some more training in jujitsu, right? So he goes to good, better, next, right? And is very deliberate about it and super objective about it too. So with that, those are five things you can do to work on that focus. But I really challenge you to practice it too. So before we get to questions, which is going to be just like 30 seconds away, I'm going to give you one more chance to, to make that card house and to see if you can do it a little bit better. So with what we know, how we pay attention, how we uh, focus, limit distractions, let's see how we can do with the same amount of time this time. So I'm going to give you a ready, set. that hopefully if you had your cards and you were doing it, that even if you didn't get the card house, it was, it was a bit better than last time, right? When we stop, when we think about what it is, we can actually make it better. So you can, you can practice it that way. So um, I do appreciate your attention for all that, that talking from me to you. I do usually like a little more interactive, but um, I am super happy and excited to take on any questions. Okay, so the question uh, is, do you have any commentary on practice time in a single day for best results on building focus? So um, I think that's going to be different for every person. I'm not going to give you a number. Um, I think taking some time every day would be actually beneficial because it's one of the things we don't really pay attention to. So if like at minimum, if you think of debriefing after every practice session, just asking yourself, uh, those three questions, maybe what went well, what could be better and what can I do better next time? Um, that would be good. So I would say if you don't do it at all and just ask yourself those three questions, that's a place to start. I mean, some people love journaling and will go on forever and write for hours and other people don't like it at all. But if you can always ask yourself those three questions after that can be helpful. We'll give it just a, a few more seconds here, Summer. Sometimes there's a bit of a lag. Um, oh, so we'll, we'll see for, for a few questions to kind of come in. Oh, okay, sure, sure. Did anybody think the monkeys were funny? Go on. <laughs> I, I was trying to, to decide what was more distracting, the monkeys or the countdown. 
The countdown stuff, uh, you probably don't get that because you got your own counting. So, um, mm -hmm. but sometimes the time clock in sports is pretty stressful. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And sorry, my neighbor apparently has a dog. I don't know if you heard that or not, but. Uh... <laughs> we have a, a thank you from, from. Oh, thank you. Really? See, <laughs> I love the monkeys. <laughs> Good, <I'm> glad. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's uh, awesome. Sometimes it's hard to just throw out questions when we're talking about something that's super sensitive and like about focus. Uh, I know, particularly in this high performance environment, it's kind of hard to say, hey, I, I struggle with this. But at the same time, I, I, I do hope that you can sit and think about it and allow yourself for some freedom to not just punish yourself for, for mistakes and, and not being properly focused, to just sit back and say, well, okay, give myself a, a break and, and just how can I make it a little bit better? Okay, Summer. Well, thank you so much for that deeply informative talk. Uh, I really enjoyed um, shifting don't quit to do it and, mm -hmm. and getting rid of that word quit. Um, so I, I need some my, my own reflection time on that. So thank you again for, for being with us today. No problem. My pleasure. It was great. <laughs>